I would now like to introduce Kate Maher. Kate is a professor in the Department of Earth System Science at Stanford. And Kate will be facilitating our session on carbon mineralization and introduces two speakers. Over to you, Kate. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce the topic of mineral carbonation and our two speakers. So the idea that carbon dioxide reacting with silicate minerals to form stable carbonate minerals, um, the idea that this can present a nearly permanent sink for carbon was first proposed in 1845 by a French mining engineer named Jacques Gableman. If we fast forward 180 years, we now know that the general process of mineral carbonation has been responsible for the long-term stability of Earth's climate by setting the base level removal rate of atmospheric CO2. We also know that the rate at which carbon is processed naturally through the scheme of CO2 reacting with silicate minerals is about a factor of 80 to 100 times slower than the rate at which we are emitting CO2 today. So you can really think about what that means in terms of volumes of reactants and products to scale this idea of mineral carbon, carbonation up to the, the level that we need it to be. And um, so I know we don't have a lot of geologists in the meeting. So one of the additional things that I'll add as, as context about mineral carbonation is that many of the minerals and glasses we would like to react with CO2 for alkalinity and base cations are actually really similar in structure to materials, um, including the glasses and ceramics that we think of or that have been proposed for permanent storage of nuclear waste. And so we're dealing with materials that at least at the, the level of the rocks that they're encompassing tend to be very, very non-reactive. And so that's an overarching challenge that we will discuss and consider in this session. And so given these constraints on, on volumes and, and rates, how do we scale this natural process to be part of the solution? Um, so to that end, our speakers will introduce us to two strategies. The first will be in situ or geologic storage in igneous or volcanic rocks. Um, and the second speaker will talk about, about ex situ or above ground storage, largely working with waste products. And then of course, at the end, we will have a conversation about the areas of convergence and divergence in terms of technical and technological needs. So uh, please feel free to hold your, to provide your questions now or hold them at the end and, and we'll do our best to address them. And so with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, who is Don DePaulo. Don received his PhD in geology from Caltech, and he's been a professor of geology and geochemistry, first at UCLA and then at UC Berkeley. He is now currently the graduate professor of geochemistry and the chancellor's professor emeritus at UC Berkeley. Don is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is widely recognized for his research using isotopic measurements as tracers and chronometers. Um, I'll also just add quickly that Don was director of the LBNL or Sciences Division, as well as associate laboratory director for energy sciences at LBNL. So he has a long history of thinking about the context of geology and, and energy systems. And including leading a US DOE Energy Frontier Research Center on nanoscale controls on geologic CO2. So thank you, Don, and feel free to share your screen and take it away. Okay, so let me start with this perspective. Uh, the, um, so th this is kind of the challenge with mineralization, and Kate mentioned this. The, uh, we're currently uh, putting CO2 into the atmosphere at about 37 gigatons per year. And uh, this diagram comes from a paper that I did a few years ago. Um, and we're just dumping it into this upper box here that has the atmosphere, the biosphere, soils, and the surface ocean. Processes within those redistribute it. Um, but the only output back to the geologic re reservoirs is the natural carbon mineralization by rock weathering. And that's estimated to be about one gigaton per year. So the problem basically, the climate problem is that one is a lot smaller than 37. And the challenge for carbon mineralization is scaling it up to the point where it can make a difference. And I think that, um, you know, the way to look at this is that we've managed to increase emissions from one which is the normal background to 37. And it might very well be possible to increase the mineralization from one to at least four or five so that it's contributing to this, uh, uh, to mitigation. So a few statements. <clears throat> um, 
show where I'm coming from with this. Subsurface mineral carbonation uh, is, is kind of an, a, a form of carbon storage, uh, but it's maybe attractive because the CO2 ends up in a permanently immobilized state. Uh, rocks that are appropriate for mineralization, as Kate mentioned, have sufficient abundance of calcium, magnesium, and iron so that they can combine with CO2 to uh, make carbonates. And those rocks are typically basalt, andesite, and peridotite. Uh, to achieve subsurface mineralization, this is a point that I think is important, takes a little time, probably hundreds of years at scale, and it's not generally instantaneous. So some people have been sort of selling this as an instant way to turn uh, CO2 into rock. I think at the scale we're talking about gigatons, it won't be instantaneous. I'll show you some uh, modeling on that. To achieve extensive mineralization requires getting the CO2 charged water into intimate contact with a large volume of rock. That's not easy, but it's possible. And keeping the CO2 in the subsurface long enough to allow the mineralization. So this is a, a key issue here. How do you keep the CO2 down there long enough to allow it to, uh, to react? And um, I think another general point that I'd like to make is that using igneous rocks, volcanic rocks largely, for CO2 disposal may be important because many populated areas around the world do not have appropriate geology for saline formation, geological carbon storage. You saw the nice maps that were showed in the context of Bex uh, of, of the United States, which has lots of storage potential. Most places in the world are not like that. Okay, so here's a simple, <laughs> actually a little bit complicated um, table of um, various targets for uh, mineral subsurface mineralization, and then some of the characteristics uh, that you'll have to deal with. Uh, so what I've listed here is onshore basalt formations, onshore volcanic sedimentary formations, and onshore ultramafic rocks. And then if you go to the marine settings, you can uh, look at coastal volcanic rocks and volcanic sediments and deep sea basalt. So things that you want to think about is, are there any opportunities for structural trapping that will keep the CO2 down there? And actually one of the things that comes into play in submarine uh, uh, environments is that the bottom of the ocean is very cold and actually below about 500 meters it's cold. And at those temperatures, CO2 hydrate is stable. So CO2 may freeze in the presence of water. Um, porosity permeability, and I could have written injectivity there, probably is about the best you can do for, for these rocks because unlike uh, sedimentary rocks where you can potentially produce oil, they haven't been drilled a lot and characterized a lot in detail. So we're guessing a lot on how permeable and what the injectivity might be. The other question is whether you need to pre-dissolve the CO2 in water before you inject it. You may be familiar with the carb fix experiment in Iceland. Their strategy is to pre-dissolve the CO2 uh, before and then inject CO2 uh, charged water into the system. This means that you don't have to worry about structural trapping, but it, it, it reduces the amount of CO2 you can you can inject per well by a large factor, partly due to the fact you need to use a lot of water. So the injection rate I put here are numbers that have come from the people working on this. Uh, for onshore basalt, like a, a carb fix, it's about 10 kilotons per year, which is a pretty small number. Uh, but I think there are places where you could potentially inject uh, supercritical CO2 directly and maybe get up to half a gigaton, uh, or half a megaton, what am I talking about here? 500 kilotons, half a megaton per year per well. Okay, let me uh, sort of talk about this in terms of a standard CO2 uh, storage situation. This shows you the sort of context of a uh, reservoir scale simulation where you have an injection well, you have a layer, uh, a reservoir, uh, porous permeable sandstone at about two kilometers depth, that's maybe 40 meters thick, and it's got a lid on the top of it, a so-called seal formation with very low permeability, and you just uh, inject the CO2 through the well, 
and let it go out into the formation and imagine this being sort of a radially symmetric situation. And so to test the mineralization efficiency, we can just sort of vary the amount of reactive minerals that have calcium, magnesium, and iron in the sandstone. And we can do this in an imaginary fashion. You don't have to have a real sandstone and just see what happens. And uh, if you look in the literature, this has been done quite a few times. And I think the figure on the left here is the main thing that I'm, I want to I want to show you, which is that if you plot the uh, percent of the CO2 that's been mineralized after 500 years in the simulation against the volume percent of reactive minerals in the rock, you get a very sim simple relationship here. Now, most of these people are using similar software. In fact, the same software in many cases, but this is what you expect that there aren't any very many other factors coming into play other than if you have the right minerals there, and you have the avail availability of these cations, you will mineralize the CO2. And the figure on the right uh, tries to give you an idea of how variable the time scale is for the mineralization. And uh, it varies, if you don't have very much mineralization going on, it's a little variable, but once you get up to the point where you are, it's not variable, it's pretty well determined. Um, okay, so one of the issues is how fast does that mineralization process actually happen? There's about three or four factors that go into calculating that, but one of them is the inherent uh, dissolution rate of the key minerals. So two of the key minerals are clinopyroxene uh, and plagioclase. And uh, these are the chemical formulas in case you've forgotten them. And um, this is a plot of, temp uh, of the re reactive or the uh, dissolution rate constant. So basically, this is one factor that you need to know in order to predict how fast these minerals are going to dissolve. It's on a log scale. And um, basically, at the temperatures of uh, typical CO2 storage, uh, you're talking, if you look at the range of values that are have been used in the literature, they expand about three or four orders of magnitude uh, between 50 and 80 degrees C. So this is a kind of problem. So if, uh, if you have a model like the previous one I showed you, if you pick uh, reaction rate constants that are close to the top of this range, you'll get a lot of mineralization in 100 or 500 years. If you pick something near the bottom, you won't get any mineralization. So this, you know, looks like a big problem, but I think this is something we can address. There haven't been very many recent experiments done on this, but this is something we could firm up, I think. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is this, <clears throat> the idea of how do you keep CO2 in the subsurface long for a long time? And I want to tell you about a project that we're working on in Hawaii, the idea of injecting CO2 into volcanic rocks in the oceans. Uh, this little dot here is the right at the Hilo airport, if you've ever been there. And this is offshore bathymetry. Uh, up in the upper right here is a, a sort of picture of what the subsurface might look like and uh, what the temperatures are and, um, and the, the density of CO2. So because the temperatures happen to be low, because there's cold seawater circulating through the rocks, the CO2 is pretty dense. So the the um, attractiveness of this type of uh, environment is that the low temperatures make the CO2 less buoyant. There's, there's a huge amount of basalt there. There's actually six kilometers of thickness of basalt under Hilo. Uh, you could presumably pre uh, inject pure CO2. You don't have to pre-dissolve it. And there's a combination of dissolution, capillary and mineral trapping, as well as CO2 hydrate formation that could come into play in immobilizing the CO2. So, I mean, just as an example, we've done some injection models of this. We've simplified the geology here. This shows how cold it is in the subsurface uh, in this in the drill core that we have there. And, um, and basically, we, we've done a simulation of injecting 50 million tons of CO2 over 100 years, and it stays down there. And over on the right, you can see that about somewhere between 50 and 75% of it gets either mineralized or dissolved uh, over uh, 500 years. So um, this is an environment that hasn't been considered very much, but I think 
has potential and could be, uh, uh, we could find similar places around the world. So the summary is there are a number of different onshore, offshore, and coastal options. Uh, there's a trade-off between injecting as pre-dissolved CO2 or as supercritical or liquid CO2. Pre-dissolving CO2 limits the amount you can inject per well and requires a lot of water. The mineral dissolution rates at low temperatures should be firmed up. Mineralization in general will not be instantaneous when injection is at the scale needed to make a difference. And these low temperature marine settings may have some advantages for results. So our next speaker is Greg Dipple from uh, the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of British Columbia. Greg studies processes and driving forces for mineral fluid interaction. And he and his students over the years have conducted a bunch of really wonderful field experimental and modeling studies to show that weathering of alkaline mine waste is vastly accelerated over background levels. And so getting at this problem of these slow inherent uh, natural rates. And so thank you, Greg, and feel free to start. Great, thank you, Kate. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'll uh, continue on with um, a discussion of carbon mineralization, focusing specifically on ex situ mineralization. And um, I thought I would just take, take the title and, and dissect it a little bit to explain what I mean by that. So we're really looking at processes that happen above ground. In mineralization, we're taking cations such as calcium and magnesium predominantly, and we're combining them with carbon dioxide. In the context of carbon removal, we need to do that from air either directly or indirectly. Um, the cations are derived typically from minerals or industrial solid waste. And the CO2 can come uh, directly from the air or it can come in more concentrated streams like we might get through DAC or BEX as we, uh, we saw uh, earlier this morning. The ultimate fate of the minerals can depend on the deployment. Um, they can end up in soils, essentially in the process of enhanced weathering within soils. They can end up being stored long-term within the industrial waste storage facilities. These are large facilities that already exist on the scale of billions of tons per year, tens of billions of tons per year. Uh, there's a potential utilization component in terms of um, developing building products that, that may have some application. And finally, some, some people actually consider that uh, the, this material could reside or, or reside long-term as alkalinity within uh, aqueous solutions such as um, rivers or oceans, but I won't focus on that today given that mineralization to me generally would mean that we make minerals not dissolved minerals. I had one here. So I'm going to quickly go through the take-home points uh, that I wanted to make today and then I will uh, uh, maybe highlight a few of these points. One is the, the capacity in the long term is probably going to be on the order of five to 10 gigatons per year, um, probably closer to, to five. Um, the cost is typically quoted at 30 to hundred dollars per ton for a number of reasons, including some raised earlier today. I think, you know, we really should be thinking about processes that are closer to $200 a ton, especially if we're doing both the capture and the mineralization. This increases the capacity and it also highlights that mineral storage uh, being effectively geologic means that it's uh, extremely durable and, and would have potentially fairly high value. Um, the capacity that's listed on the order, you know, five to 10 gigatons per year, the real issue here is that most of that capacity currently isn't deployable at a rate that's significant. So the issue here is around finding ways to use that capacity uh, and accelerating processes so that it happens at a rate that means something. And generally we can do that through either prospect, prospecting or seeking out the reactive material that's inherently highly reactive or using treatment, treatments or enhancements to uh, create that reactivity. In terms of research needs to, to move this forward, uh, we need to think about capacity in terms of rate. And so we really need to start to look inventory, what is being produced, what exists historically and what might be produced in the future. We need to, um, we need to figure out these treatments or enhancements for reactivity and be able to deploy them at scale and at relatively low cost. And lastly, many of the uh, models being or the methods being put out for, um, for carbon mineralization are relying on relatively simplistic geochemical models. And we need to, to, we need to really um, up the game on these reactive transport models that involve exchange between gases, liquids, and minerals and we need to validate and calibrate them with, with large-scale field studies. 
And with those kinds of tools, we can, I think, better assess the issues in terms of impact for land, water usage, cost, uh, potential pollution, and other impacts. Um, permanence, as I referred to earlier, is for vir virtually geological, so it's highly durable. I'll talk a little bit about verification and, and maybe some paths forward for this, for this approach. So the process here is one whereby we dissolve cations, we, we combine them with CO2, and we use them to make carbonate minerals, which gives us virtually permanent storage. Um, the idea here is that in capture from air, we're typically limited by the rate of CO2 capture. And when we supply concentrated CO2, like you might do from DAC or BEX, um, then we, we really are limited by mineral dissolution. So to increase rate, we need to make those minerals dissolve quickly. The capacity numbers are typically thrown out, um, come from papers like this from Renforth and Beerling. This looks at rates of, of alkaline waste production uh, for several different uh, scenarios into the future. Another thing that's talked about is mineral amendments to soil. This is actually an amalgamated figure. I put two figures together from the Beerling et al. paper. And the point here is it really shows in the green lower numbers on a country by country basis, the amount of capture of gigatons of CO2 per year as a function of deployment versus the actual amount of solid material needed. So this, the, the mineral amendments um, isn't really included in that five to 10 gigaton uh, scale. Um, it's a, it has a total of about two gigatons per year, but it's gonna require a lot of mining to get there, not a lot of new mining to get there. So to, these are some data from some studies we've done. When we look at mineral dissolution rates, we see typically that, that um, industrial materials and mine tailings, which are finely crushed rock as a waste stream from mine, really have two classes of reactivity. We have a fraction that reacts hundreds of times faster than, than hundreds of times faster than bulk stoichiometric mineral dissolution, which would kind of be your textbook rates. So the key here is finding those materials where a significant fraction is in that labile fraction. And so in this case here, the plot on the left is an actual mine tailings from a mine that produces 11 million tons of tailings per year. And if five to 7% of those tailings reactive capacity is labile, that means we have an option for actually using it for direct air capture. And the plot on the right just shows some of the diversity across a number of different um, minerals, mines, and industrial waste types that we've looked at. And we can see that it's extremely variable and that the reaction rate varies over many orders of magnitude. And these data come from far from, far from equilibrium uh, flow through dissolution reactor studies that we do at, uh, at UBC. Just as we can, we can prospect for these highly reactive materials, we can also move curves from the left to the right through chemical treatments and enhancements. So um, just a, a quick point on how we might uh, look to prospect for these materials. This is a result of a recent study, uh, Mitch and Senadal preliminary report was released late last year, final report due out uh, later this year and by Juice Lines BC, which is a government funding agency. This map on the left runs through central British Columbia from the Washington border all the way up to the Yukon border. Uh, and this study basically looked at existing geological uh, and geophysical data to do inversions of um, over 200 ultramafic rock bodies to identify those that were highly serpentinized because we find that serpentinized ultramafic rocks have a much higher proportion of labile magnesium. And from that, we estimate that there's enough serpentinized I left enough labile magnesium and serpentinized ultramafic rocks in the top kilometer of the crust within British Columbia to mineralize 56 gigatons of CO2 in total. This is about 800 years of BC's uh, greenhouse gas emissions to put it in, in perspective. Of course, we don't wanna mine all, all the, the thousands of cubic kilometers as that implies, but it allows us to identify opportunities where we might be able to co-develop this with uh, development of, of uh, precious or battery metals or other, other opportunities. So this, this is the idea that we can use tools from mineral exploration to identify optimal areas to deploy carbon mineralization as well. For large scale validation, we really need to, to, to do reactive transport modeling in these complex systems, but we need to do them at large scale and deploy them with, uh, with uh, uh, validate them and calibrate them against field data. This is a result of one such model, which just looked at the effect of, of moving a mine in Western Australia uh, to different climates around the world and showed how the, uh, the anticipated rate of CO2 capture from air can be substantially affected by climate uh, in this particular instance. <clears throat> 
So as we develop and improve and calibrate and validate these models, they're gonna give us a lot of important information on impacts as well as permanence and durability. Monitoring and verification, I think is uh, in mine tailings is relatively straightforward. We certainly deploy a, com a combination of geochemical techniques, measuring um, solid carbonate content before and after large scale fields experiments. And we couple them with um, soil gas chamber flux systems and eddy covariance systems. Essentially, we're comparing mass balances from the gas phase in the atmosphere above the mine tailings and contrasting that against uh, cumulative carbonate uptake as measured by the total carbonate content in the material after a period of time. And when we find good convergence between those methods, essentially comparing mass balance in the solid mineral phases against mass balances in the gas phase above it, when we find convergence, we have a fair bit of confidence that the carbonate is uh, being sequestered and mineralized in real time. The last point I was uh, wanted to make was that, uh, you know, there's a lot of complexity within these individual systems. I thought I'd use the example of uh, battery metal mining, uh, in particular nickel mining, to show some of the complexity. So these bars here are tons of CO2 um, mineralized or emitted per ton of tailings, finely ground rock per year. The red bars on the left show three different existing mines, depending on whether or not it's um, um, a high pressure acid leach uh, laterite nickel mine versus a nickel sulfide mine versus my, a nickel mine running in a jurisdiction like British Columbia, where the electricity generation is by hydroelectricity. Uh, we can see that the carbon footprint, there's, there's fleet emissions, which uh, are difficult to grab as a point source. Uh, so often we have electricity generation on site within a mine, so we potentially can use electricity generation as a point source of CO2. We find that the labile fraction or the reactivity of tailings actually depends on the concentration of CO2. So a single tailing sample will have a different capacity or a different labile magnesium fraction, depending on whether or not we're feeding it air, flue gas, or 100% CO2. But a lot of the reactivity, it comes, uh, can, be, can be accessed simply with reaction with air. We can think that we can match the dark colors against across the horizontal axis here, and we can use air capture to offset truck emissions, um, point sources to, for flue gas capture. And if we prospect for the highly reactive tailings, that would be the green column on the far left. That represents an opportunity for many of these mine operations to operate net negative in terms of CO2 emissions. And on the far right, I show a, um, you know, where we're going to into the future. So first of all, I think that um, we, will be dri we will be driving the mining of, of metals like nickel that are essential for electrification of transportation away from deposit types like laterites, which inherently have a high carbon footprint towards the sulfide type deposits, which have an inherently lower carbon footprint of mining. Once we move them across to renewable energy and we look at transformation of the haul fleet away from fossil fuel combustion, we, and if we also combine that with prospecting for highly reactive mine tailings materials, we have the potential to create a significant, significant capacity to not only completely offset the emissions of mining, but also generate net negative mining and, and carbon removal from the atmosphere in the same industrial processes that we uh, are using to generate the nickel, which we need for our Teslas and our, and our car batteries. So I put this forward as an example that I think these kinds of, these are the shorter turn up term opportunities that will give us confidence and, um, and pathways to deploying mineralization at larger scales. So with that, I will um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, just again, emphasizing the points um, in, uh, from five through 10, really emphasizing some future needs and areas of focus for future research. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, we're gonna go ahead and turn to the panel discussion. And I, I, wanna, I wanna ask, both Greg and Don for their perspectives on mineral kinetics, but I, I wanna start with Greg because you talked about the need for either prospecting to find these more labile materials or developing treatments. And so I'm curious if you could comment on, you know, what are some of the treatments that seem most promising? What are the different factors, cost energy that need to be considered? Are there any that look like they might be cost effective? And then on the flip side of that, in terms of the prospecting, what controls the label, labile magnesium uh, fraction and are the mining companies at all incentivized to help map out at that potential uh, uh, quality? Great, thanks. Yeah, no, good, good questions. You know, in terms of um, 
accelerating uh, mineral dissolution to create more labile cations. Um, you know, the, 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 the gold medal there would be to, to optimize uh, feldspar dissolution because there's feldspar in so abundant in the crust and also so many of the largest metal mines in the world are in feldspar, uh, uh, in feldspar rich. Uh, rocks, that's an incredibly hard nut to crack. I'm not sure, but if someone can figure that out, that would be a massive game changer in terms of, of, of mineralization. Um, I think, you know, we're currently going back and looking at, at, at modifications or treatments that we dismissed five or 10 years ago as being too expensive because now we really see the long-term carbon price at being closer to $200 per ton. And that actually allows you to think about using techniques that, you know, we certainly had set aside uh, uh, previously, because we were focused on sort of $50 per ton solutions. I think if we're doing capture and mineralization, we should actually be targeting the one to $200 per ton processes because those would be deployable at a significant scale and, and maybe generate the benefit that we, the benefit that we need. In terms of the prospecting for our um, labile cations, it's very much, it's predominantly mineralogically controlled and we're starting to build a good understanding of that. Uh, we see that it's highly variable. We've done, uh, we've, we build sort of proxy models where we can compute mineralogy from exploration geochemistry and we've developed, um, you know, based on eight or 10,000 exploration analyses, we've built three-dimensional models of the distribution of labile cations within say a billion ton nickel deposit. We find it's highly variable and that the top, you know, two to 3% of the material has extremely high labile cation contents, and, and we've validated that by, by going out and collecting that material and analyzing it in the lab. So there are is a, a small fraction that's highly reactive within individual deposits and continuous over several meters of drill core length when these, when these deposits are drilled. If those really, if that few percent of these ultramafic rocks can, if we can figure out how to mine them selectively in a way that has a low carbon footprint and not, and not, too, uh, not a large uh, stripping ratio, then we really are enabling, um, you know, that would be that would be a game changer within these deposits. You can imagine if you had capacity within British Columbia alone for 50 plus gigatons, you only, if you only got 1% of that, that would still be a very significant rate of carbon mineralization um, within, within the context of British Columbia alone. And also you'd be really reducing the amount of mining if you can, if you can find ways to do this selective mining. So those are technologies and approaches that the mining industry has to come up with. In reference to your last question, they are strongly motivated. You know, several of the biggest mining companies in the world have declared that they will become carbon neutral and they have no idea how they're gonna get there by and large, I think. But also there's a significant players in the mining industry are the junior companies. They're the ones that actually find the deposits. Most of the nickel deposits we work on are being developed by junior companies and they just want to sell it up the food chain to the larger companies. And if they can demonstrate high, re high reactivity to CO2 in the last 12 to 18 months, that's become a game changer in how the interactions between the juniors and the multinationals go. So there's a huge amount of motivation within the mining industry to figure this out. Interesting. Thanks, Greg. Don, I want to turn to you with a, a similar question in terms of your perspective on, you know, chemical treatments or are there physical treatments that you guys have been thinking about for volcanic rocks to, to manage some of the injectivity problems that you might face? Um, you know, what do you see as being potentially important to address in that, in that area of the kinetics of in situ injection? Well, I think the, the biggest problem is to get some reliable data on what the rocks are like as they are now. <laughs> um, you know, if you're working at uh, materials sitting at the surface, you can do some tests on them, but uh, you have to work in wells and you have to, uh, it's expensive to work downhole. And so um, the question is whether there's gonna be enough interest from people who are willing to fund this kind of thing to do the downhole work that's gonna be necessary to characterize things like uh, uh, reactivity and injectivity in basalts as you know the ones that we think might be reasonable targets. Um, once we have that information, we might have some ideas about how to improve it. But I think you know the problem with operating at scale is that if you're going to do gigatons, you you you, you sort of have to have the natural uh, <laughs> resource giving you what you need. Uh, it's hard to change it. And, and do that economically, uh, especially if it's underground. 
And, and kind of related questions on, um, you know, you've mentioned the majority of demonstration sites, carb fix and the PNNL site were, were really low injection rates and often CO2 mixed with water. If, if you really were able to propose, you know, what's the next step up in scale that we should be thinking about to understand this process better? Do you have like a, a conceptual model on hand, on hand in terms of a field test that you would, would like to see happen? Well, what it comes down to is what is the vertical permeability of, of sections of basalt that are thick enough that you would be confident to be able to inject into them at the, at the appropriate depth. Um, the, the um, you know, right now, carb fix, I mean, the, the other problem is, you know, if you could instantly mineralize the CO2, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. I just don't think that that's, that's likely. Uh, carb fix in their second, uh, you know, the first version of carb fix, they only injected a couple hundred tons of CO2 and they, and they got most of that mineralized, I think. But now they're, they're injecting about 10,000 tons per year, but they're injecting it into a geothermal system at 250 degrees C, where they can pretty much guarantee that the reactions are going to go fast enough to mineralize the CO2. But you know, restricting the, uh, that strategy to geothermal systems and basalts is very restrictive. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not gonna be very many places around the world where you can do that or would you, where you would want to. And they're still only up to 10,000 tons per well per year. So I think we need to find places where we can, you know, throw the CO2 in there as pure CO2 and um, expect it to stay down there and be dissolved, mineralized, frozen into hydrate or whatever it takes. But I think uh, in the long run, it will get mineralized, but it might be a thousand years before it gets mineralized. Main point is to make sure it doesn't come back up and you're not gonna have a shale or some you know, really low permeability sedimentary rock to cap it. But there may be enough uh, uh, variability and, and, and low, low permeability layers in these basalt sections that it will stay down there. But we need to do those. Those will be field tests. And um, again, once there's a commitment from, um, you know, in the U.S., it would be the Department of Energy or some private, uh, you know, ph philanthropist to say, well, okay, we've got to figure out what we can do with basalts. Then uh, the this level of funding might be available to do the downhole tests to get started. I, you're making me wonder too about characterization methods because I, my understanding is seismic characterization that's so widely used in oil and gas does not work very well in these basaltic basins. Where do you see as a sort of characterization need in all of this? Do you have to do it from wells or are there other things we could be trying to, to develop to, to really map these basins and their potential? I, I think they're, you know, obviously if you can do seismic, you're a lot better off because you can characterize large volumes of the subsurface that way. Electromagnetics might be helpful too, um, but eventually you have to ground truth some of it with well data. <laughs> So the whole thing needs to be done. Uh, we need more well information coupled with uh, tests on what we can do with seismic and electromagnetics. Thanks, Don. Um, Greg, I also had some, some questions for you thinking about sort of the second step in the process that so we've talked about reactivity and kinetics. Um, there's this CO2 delivery stage and I think you mentioned both being able to use tailings as direct air capture, as well as kind of point source. Um, I'm also curious how those would differ and what opportunities there might be if, from a more industrial type of setting. But also, I, you know, you sort of touched on this, but I'm really curious about water. How much water do you need to really make the direct air capture an efficient process for these tailings? Yeah, no, water, water is, a, is a major, major issue. So we're kind of pushing two different technologies. One is reaction definitely with the atmosphere. And for that, we are manipulating and managing the surfaces of these large tailing storage facilities. So at a um, typical nickel mine, the tailing storage facility might have a, uh, a, lands, uh, a surface area of about um, 15 square kilometers. So they're large industrial storage facilities and we can uh, substantially increase the rate by which they capture CO2 from air by managing the water content. 
and by doing um, essentially churning or stirring so that we're, we're bringing up fresh material. Uh, keeping in mind that these tailing storage facilities, they're continually laying down fresh material. So um, on the time scale of months or so, the surface will be refreshed with new reactive material all, already, but on the basis of the industrial process. And so, um, so it's really the water content that we manage for is, is you know, 10 to 20 percent of tailings by mass, which is what it will um, normally inherently hold if it's if it's drained. So usually the water issue for air capture is too much water, not enough. And then water is recirculated within the process cir uh, circuit within an operating mine so that it's it's not new water usage. It's more the usage of the of the process water. Unfortunately, almost all mines have a water problem. Either they have too little water or they have too much. And so there's always water management is one major issue for mines generally. And so it will have an impact on operations if you're trying, trying, um, trying to do that. For the capture at higher concentrations, we, we um, rely basically on injection. And so for that to work, we really need the higher concentrations of CO2. And we also need pneumatic permeability within the tailing. So we typically look at you know, some mine types like diamond mining, they, uh, they already generate both a fine and a coarse stream. And we find that by blending those back together in the proportion at which they're produced, produces a material that's both reactive, but also has relatively low permeabilities at these similar water contents. So the technology that's being scaled up and starting to be used in mines is, is something called dry stack tailings. That's where the industry is moving because it gets rid of the need for water saturated tailings and large dams, which have huge safety risks. Uh, and so the industry is moving towards new uh, storage technologies that are actually quite well um, situated to allow for injection within those materials if the tailings are reactive. Respond. Is there any calculation method to predict the release or behavior of cations in different rock structures? Um, if I understand the, <laughs> the, the, the question right, I mean, at, at what rate will they be released from the minerals to be available to make, min uh, make new carbonate minerals? Yeah, I think the question is, is related to your, maybe your slide, Don, where you were talking about, you know, we know the kinetics of these different minerals. We have a, a big amalgamation of different minerals. How can we, what methods do we use to predict the release from those rock packages? Um, well, what we do is use the parameters that we can get out of the literature that come from experiments and apply them to the rocks. And um, the way this works is that if the reactions are going really fast, then there's a lot of things that can come into play to slow them down. But if they're not going that fast, then you, we can predict it reasonably well. And it comes down to whether we know those uh, reaction rate constants well enough. And um, so my view of this is we can predict these things, but we need, <laughs> need to be a little bit more confident in the basic data that we're inputting. And I, I think also just to, to add to that, the surface area that's actually exposed to the fluid in a real porous media is also a challenge that's very hard to characterize. We can do things for some, some single minerals, but it's hard to get to that composite porous media um, but I think without adding a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, if the reactions are going fast, the surface area term is going to be really important. Uh, if they're going slow, that may not be the limiting issue because the surface the surface area that you need is going to be <laughs> going to be exposed on a long time scale. So um, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do what Greg is trying, you know, talking about at the surface, you want the reactions to go fast. You need to know the surface area that you're exposing to the to the reactive liquids. Think on the subsurface, you'll get the exposure on a hundred year time scale. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Thanks, Don. I see Sarah popping on, which probably means that we're out of time and need to move to the next panel. Great. Thank you, uh, Craig, Don, and Kate. That was a wonderful discussion.